Loa, and thank you for tuning to the tonight's Thursday, April 22nd, 2021 Hanama Talk Seminar Series presented by the City and County of Honolulu and the Hawaii Sea Grant Hanama Bay Education Program. For the month of April, we've been co-partnering with the Hawaii Audubon Society. And tonight we have the pleasure of hosting Richard Downs, who is the director of Hui Manu Oku. He'll be talking about Honolulu's white terns, the trees they breed in, and the arbor culture community and urban conservation success story. Uh, my name is Gavin Y, and I am the Hanawa Bay Education Program Outreach Program Coordinator. I have this in my contact info below, um, the phone number and email as well, in case you need to contact me about any information about our seminar series and other outreach program opportunities. Also, I have listed the Hanama Talks YouTube channel in case you guys are interested in checking out uh, past seminars. So a little background on our seminar series, the Hanawa Bay Education Program partners with organizations across Hawaii to showcase educational talks with leading researchers, environmental leaders, natural resource managers, and cultural practitioners. Um, it starts promptly at 6.30 p.m. and ends at 7.30 p.m. with a 45-minute presentation time and a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. Um, so just a few friendly reminders during the presentation. Please keep all your questions till the end of the presentation or feel free to type it in the chat box at any time and we will address it at the question answer period at the end. Also, please remember to turn off your microphone and, a video, and your video function during the seminar um, to allow a smoother presentation. So just a little background on our presenter tonight, who is Richard Downs. For the past five years, he has been coordinating the efforts of the Hui Manu Oku to enhance the awareness, appreciation, understanding, and conservation of the white term. He leads the Hui Citizen Science Project to better understand this understudied species and the fascinating story of its unique relationship with the most developed part of the Hawaiian island chain. He is an amateur ornithologist who divides his time between Honolulu and his home in Maryland. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Richard. Yes, well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us this evening. It's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here to, to talk with you about the, the white terns. And um, uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about the white terns, uh, the trees they breed in, and uh, the uh, very important arboricultural community that um, maintains those trees, which together we think constitutes a really, really interesting urban conservation success story. So I'm going to be talking about some of our partners, um, but tonight there are, there are a couple of partners I want to uh, call out, um, uh, but not, they're not necessarily part of this part of the conservation story. Uh, some of you may have overheard uh, Linda Elliott and, and um, myself chatting a little bit before we got started. Uh, Linda is from the Hawaii Wildlife Center. Uh, we consider the Hawaii, Hawaii Wildlife Center to be a, a very, very important partner for us, the, the Hui Mano Oku, in our work with the, the white terns. Uh, one of the things that we do, I'll, talk, I'll touch on a little bit uh, tonight, but one of the things that we do is um, when uh, white terns, uh, chicks especially, fall out of the trees, we uh, do our best to put them back in the trees, so reunite them with their parents. We're not always able to do that, and uh, when we're not able to do that, we are very, very happy to be able to be partnering with the Hawaii Wildlife Center uh, and their staff uh, there on the Big Island to uh, rehab the terns uh, and to get them back into shape so they can be put back in the trees and released into the wild um, through our other partner, uh, another one of our partners, the Honolulu Zoo. So I won't be talking much about the Hawaii Wildlife Center or the zoo tonight, but I wanted to do a give a shout out to them and express our appreciation for their willingness to work with us uh, for the sake of the turns um, on, on Oahu. Uh, yeah, so this has been a pretty busy year, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty busy past a month or so uh, in terms of our rescue efforts. Uh, we've sent uh, uh, over a dozen uh, turns, uh, mostly chicks, uh, to, to the Hawaii Wildlife Center because we weren't able to uh, reunite them with their parents. But uh, so thanks much to Linda and, uh, and company at the uh, Hawaii Wildlife Center and to our friends uh, at the zoo. Also want to say, give a shout out to uh, Hawaii Audubon Society, who is an um, uh, important partner, one of the, the 
uh, sponsors of the of the Hui Mano Oku. Just real quickly, Hui Mano Oku is um, an informal grouping of individuals, uh, agencies, organizations uh, uh, that have an interest in the in the white turns. And uh, our mission is to uh, promote uh, increased understanding, awareness, appreciation, and the conservation of the turns. And we thank all of our those who partner with us uh, to uh, to accomplish our, our mission. Uh, yes, yeah, so for the past five years, uh, we've been working with our partners to uh, increase our understanding uh, of the turns. And uh, one of the uh, results of our uh, increased uh, understandings of the turns, uh, breeding on, on Oahu, is that uh, we needed to, uh, to change uh, the, the guidance that has been being given to uh, those who take care of the trees uh, on Oahu. Uh, so we, um, uh, in conjunction with a, a DLNR in the Aloha Arborist Association, uh, we uh, uh, pulled together the, the results of our, of our studies uh, over the, the past five years, other turns and their breeding practices on Oahu and produced a document, uh, Tree Care Guidelines and Best Practices for Mono Oku Breeding Sites, published in 2019. Um, yeah, this, uh, this uh, your documents uh, the findings, uh, 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 this documents our increased understanding of the, uh, of the terns and their breeding behavior on Oahu and the implications for uh, your, uh, tree management practices. I also want to uh, give a, a thanks and a shout out to the Kaulunani Urban and Community Forestry Program. They're the ones who funded the project and uh, truly without their support, uh, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to do the study and, and produce materials and tools that are now available to the, uh, the tree care professionals on Oahu. Uh, yeah, so uh, why do we need guidelines and best practices for, uh, for, uh, for trimming trees? Um, well, uh, as it turns out now, uh, those involved in, in, in uh, managing trees uh, need to you make uh, your well-informed uh, decisions when and where uh, to, to trim trees, for example, and then to be able to do that in ways that uh, help them to avoid uh, harming the, the, the turns. Um, the trees are really important. Uh, for a number of reasons. They're, they're important to uh, the people who live in Oahu, uh, on Oahu. Uh, and it turns out they're very important to the terns who breed, who breed on Oahu. Uh, so we need to make sure that uh, those who are taking care of those trees uh, are best equipped to do so in a way that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, helps to protect the terns. And also to improve uh, public awareness of the importance of that relationship between the terns, the trees that they uh, breed in, and, uh, and those who, who, who tend the trees. Um, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the messages that, uh, uh, that, that had been promoted in the past was um, the, actually the, the threats that uh, white terns uh, faced uh, from, from tree trimming activities. Uh, and while there certainly have been cases in the past where turns you know, have been injured uh, as a result of tree trimming activities, uh, we now know that it's possible to trim trees with the turns in them if you do it in a way that uh, takes, takes their presence into account. Uh, and so we, we want to help to make sure the public is aware that it is possible to trim trees with the turns uh, in, the, in the trees. Uh, and then you know, by doing so that, that will help the uh, tree trimming uh, community to uh, Im improve its, uh, its relationship with the communities and with the agencies that, that are, that are uh, empowered and entrusted to enforce the, the laws and regulations pertaining to, the preser pertaining to the conservation of the terms. So yes, guidelines and, and uh, documenting best practices was very important. Uh, so the first thing was uh, uh, we realized we had to change some of our, our thinking and some of the guidance that uh, we, were, we were giving to those who, who um, uh, maintain the trees. The first one, the, the first uh, 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 new guidance has to do with uh, whether or not uh, um, it's, it's advised to, uh, uh, to work in close proximity to uh, nesting turns. Um, 
as it turns out, it is quite okay. Uh, there's, the terns choose to breed on Oahu, on Oahu in places where there are lots of people. Uh, so by their own choice, they're bringing themselves into very close proximity with, uh, with, with, with us humans and uh, the things that we do. Uh, there was a belief that the tree trimming company should stay away from trees if the uh, terns were breeding in them. Uh, as it turns out, that's just not feasible uh, given the number of trees that they're breeding in and given the fact that they're breeding now essentially year round on Oahu. Uh, another bit of false, uh, you know, incorrect understanding in the, from the past was that uh, if a trimmer is working in a tree and the turns start flying around them, that they that they need to uh, discontinue work and uh, leave the area. Yeah, we now know that uh, you know adult turns will be flushed, uh, will get to be, you'll become agitated and, and start flying around. Um, but if they're able to fly around, then that means that they're actually getting themselves out of harm way, harm's way. What we're more concerned about is uh, uh, turns that are uh, incubating eggs or that are tending chicks or the chicks themselves, which of course aren't able to get out of, out of the, the way of, of workers in the trees. But if, if uh, turns are flying around while work is being done in the tree, uh, that's that's, that's okay, they just need to be aware of uh, what's going on. And uh, uh, lastly, but also very importantly, um, there is a, a notion that if, a, if a, a turn is found on the ground, especially if a chick is found on the ground and if someone touches it to, to, uh, uh, to pick it up, to protect it, that uh, somehow the, the scent of the human will be left on the chick and, and it will be rejected. Uh, that's not the case. Actually, I don't know if that's the case with any birds, but uh, we know it's not the case with the terns. And in, in fact, uh, we now encourage trimmers, if uh, they come across a, a chick that's on the ground, uh, we, 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 we teach them what they can do to uh, uh, attempt to put it back up in the tree. So those are uh, old notions that uh, have um, been, we're trying to replace with, uh, with new understandings. Uh, the new understandings are, are, as I say, are based on information gathered uh, over the years, uh, the past through the recent years. Uh, and we have a, now a, a training program that we've put together with uh, the Aloha Arborist Association and DLNR to uh, uh, train the, uh, uh, the uh, tree care professionals in the, uh, the, the new best practices. Uh, and amongst the things that we train is the, the new tools and the protocols that uh, we've come up with based on uh, our, new un our current understanding of the turns and their breeding behaviors, as well as uh, the procedures to follow in, in the event of an emergency. It all starts with what we know about the, the, uh, the breeding biology of the turns uh, on Oahu, uh, where they're found, uh, and uh, it, it starts with also making sure we're that we can differentiate uh, white terns from other white birds that uh, are found on Oahu. Um, white terns are completely white in color in the plumage. Uh, no, other, no, no, no other color on their feathers um, except white. By the time they become an adult, they are, they are all white. Uh, also, the uh, distinguish, distinguishing feature of the white terns is they have a, a pointed, you know, fairly long a black beak. Uh, dark eyes and uh, wingspan is you know, 30 inches plus or minus and uh, the, the males and the females look exactly alike. Uh, can't tell them apart just by looking at them. Yeah, there are a couple of other species of, of uh, white birds on Oahu, you know, you know white pigeons is, uh, downtown and we also have um, uh, you know, cattle egrets uh, downtown. Um, yeah, they can easily be confused. Uh, so uh, Look, watch closely to, um, and we, we work with the tree trimmers to help them to uh, be able to differentiate between the terns and, and other birds that they might encounter in the trees. Uh, we now have a, a good understanding of where they're breeding on Oahu. Um, this map shows the uh, distribution of the uh, trees that uh, we, where we have documented them breeding. Uh, the red pins indicate the trees that we uh, knew of uh, uh, back in 2016. The uh, white pins are trees uh, added to the breeding map uh, through our continuing study you know, in 2017. 
and uh, the green and the blue ones for uh, those that have in subsequent years. And uh, what you can see is that the, uh, the number of trees that they are using continues to grow. Uh, we're up to about 1,600 trees now. Um, and the, the range ex has expanded somewhat, uh, not much, uh, to the east, uh, um, the Hawaii Kai area. Uh, we do see some pushing further to the west, uh, not shown on this map, are uh, the increasing number of trees we're seeing in the, the Pearl Harbor, Pearl City area. Uh, what, mostly what we are seeing, though, is sort of filling in uh, with space within the, the, the known breeding range. Uh, yeah, still adding a, on average about a couple hundred trees uh, per year to the, uh, to the breeding map. Uh, you'll notice from the map that uh, the uh, areas where they're breeding are the areas with the most uh, development and uh, uh, human activity uh, on Oahu. This is uh, a tree uh, on Kalakaua uh, in the heart of Waikiki. Uh, you notice that tree about six feet up is a branch with a, a nesting turn uh, tucked between a, a busy, busy sidewalk on one side and a, in the, the busy highway on the other side. So um, um, they're, they're tolerant of human activity. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, if, you, if you were to go down to uh, the, the um, downtown Waikiki, uh, go to the International Marketplace, uh, which up until the past year, had been a very, very busy place. Uh, the, the big banyan tree there is, uh, uh, sees uh, human activity walking around uh, under the branches uh, on uh, three levels. Um, but that tree has uh, over 20 nesting spots, uh, some very, very close uh, to uh, where, where people are walking. Um, yeah, so we are yet to, uh, we're, we're, <laughs> We're still being amazed at the degree of, of uh, toleration that the terns have for, for us and, and our activities. Um, yeah, so how long do white terns live? Uh, typically, they live 16 to 18 years, but uh, we know of at least one uh, on Oahu that has lived uh, much longer than that. Uh, during our surveying back in 2016, we came across one that was breeding uh, across the Iolani Palace uh, there in front of the post office. Um, it had a band on its leg, and over time, we were able to recover the the, uh, the digits on the band. Sent the number into the uh, the, the bird banding lab, and uh, they sent us back a letter of appreciation and uh, letting us know that uh, we had found a turn that's it's 35 years old at the time and uh, still breeding. And that that one is the uh, the oldest known uh, turn uh, breeding on Oahu, so they they can live. Uh, uh, considerably longer than the, uh, the typical 16, 18 year lifespan. Uh, this is probably one of the more important discoveries uh, that came out of our uh, uh, surveying uh, back, starting back in 2016. Um, it had previously been thought that uh, breeding was pretty much concentrated in the January, February, March timeframe with uh, not much happening before or after. Uh, and that there was a time of the year when there was virtually no breeding taking place. So uh, at tree trimmers were advised to do your trimming of trees where terns have been seen breeding in the past. Uh, you trim those trees in the summertime when there was virtually no breeding activity. And we now know that actually there is breeding activity throughout the entire year. Uh, yes, there is a peak in the January, February, March timeframe, but uh, there are terns breeding on Oahu the downtown Honolulu Waikiki uh, year round. So that understanding made it, uh, you know, it made it uh, you know, unfeasible for us to continue to advise uh, tree trimmers to uh, avoid uh, trimming trees when the turns are present because some areas, some trees just simply have turns breeding in them year round. So we have to uh, uh, just figure out how to trim with the turns in the trees and there are ways to do that. Uh, you might uh, notice here there are two colors to the uh, this bar chart. Uh, there's um, a bluish color that indicates uh, the total number of eggs that we saw laying uh, during a particular month. And uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, green indicates the uh, the number of eggs that we saw being laid that uh, are, were the first eggs being laid by a nesting pair. 
Um, but the, the chart, another point that the chart shows that, uh, yeah, uh, terns uh, lay one egg at a time, um, but uh, very often they will uh, lay, uh, lay more than once per season, uh, having successfully fudged a chick or, or after losing an egg or a chick, they will very often uh, uh, lay another egg. Uh, so one of the one of the unique uh, um, aspects of the, the white terns is the fact that uh, they are the only uh, seabird that lays eggs in trees without uh, the benefit of, of a nest. Uh, there are some seabirds that uh, um, at least you know, pretend to build nests and they gather sticks and place them in the trees and then uh, lay their eggs in, you know, in the in the a pile of sticks. White terns uh, just simply don't do anything of, of of the kind at all. They uh, find a, a spot in the nest, a, a spot in the tree uh, that can help them to hold the, uh, the egg in place and then lay the egg uh, directly on the surface of the, of the, the branch. The, these photos show some of the, the configurations that we find uh, the terns uh, using in the trees. And once they find those nesting spots, they tend to come back and use them uh, year after year. Um, which makes it, this makes it easier for us to, uh, to survey because we then are able to document the nesting spots that they use and then uh, uh, continue to watch those nesting spots for the, the presence of the, of, the, of the nesting terns. Uh, you might ask yourself, is that a good idea? Uh, all the other species of birds that uh, lay eggs in trees, uh, they, they build nests and then lay the eggs uh, in the nest. Uh, and I used to think that that was uh, something perhaps eventually the terns would uh, learn to do uh, until I, I watched um, this turn on an egg uh, down near the Ala Moana uh, shopping center on a very windy day. Whoops. Yeah, on a very windy day. And uh, notice it was sitting on an egg. So the, that is the we call it the the nesting position uh, where they uh, uh, lay down on the egg and then uh, uh, hold on. Uh, in this case, hold on tight. Uh, if you look at the, the the feet of a white tern, you'll notice that uh, they are they are uh, semi web. At the end of each toe, they have a very sharp claw and um, they're able to sink those claws into the bark of the tree and uh, hold themselves uh, you're tightly to the egg, you're sandwiching it between themselves and the, and the tree. Uh, so um, they're able to ride out very strong winds, uh, it's, which is important since uh, the breeding season tends to be the windiest time of the year uh, on Oahu. Um, so, Having seen this uh, now a number of times, uh, seeing the, the terns uh, sitting there incubating an egg successfully you know, through uh, uh, very strong winds, it uh, now seems that's actually a pretty good adaptation uh, because if, if they were sitting on an egg in a nest uh, and strong winds came along, likely the, the, the nest would be blown out of the tree along with the egg and uh, it would be lost. So, it probably is a, actually is a good idea not to, uh, to build a nest if you're uh, gonna be nesting in trees uh, during the windy part of the year. We've also learned that uh, the terns are, um, um, will lay their eggs in a, a quite a number of species of trees. Uh, we've documented over 58 different species of trees, but there are certain species that they they, they, they seem to show a preference for. Uh, these are the, the species of trees that we see them using most often. Uh, also, the, uh, they will nest in trees that are rather small uh, in size of six inches in diameter uh, up to those that are very, very large uh, over your 10 feet in diameter. Um, so the uh, breeding biology uh, uh, we, one of the things that we teach the, uh, the trimmers is um, uh, how, to, how to identify an adult you know, uh, that's incubating an, an egg. Uh, you can't always see the egg, um, but there are uh, certain behaviors that will help them to, to know that uh, 
uh, that they probably are sitting on an egg. The uh, turn you're seeing here is in the, the classic uh, incub nesting position. Uh, I sit there uh, very calmly, very quite still uh, for day after day for uh, 35 days. Uh, if you see a turn sitting in a tree for you know, an extended period of time like this in the same spot, a uh, very good chance that it's, that it's on an egg. Because typically uh, during the day, they're out flying, uh, out fishing, because they are seabirds. Um, but if you see one, you're sitting in the same spot in a tree for a number of days, a uh, good chance that it's on an egg. We may also teach the, uh, the, the, the tree trimmers uh, things to look for, uh, signs, uh, indications that uh, an adult might be a, a caring for a chick in a tree, even if you can't see the chick. Uh, and once the egg, is, once the egg hatches, uh, it's, it's of six to seven weeks before the chick is uh, able to fly. So from the time it hatches, it's about 45 days until it fledges. <clears throat> during that, <clears throat> excuse me, during that time, uh, the chick will be spending much of its time just sitting there alone in the tree uh, while the parents are out fishing. So uh, trimmers do have to be very, very careful when they are trimming to be uh, on the lookout for chicks ranging in size from quite small to uh, the size of uh, essentially the size of an adult. Uh, and then even after the chicks are able to fly uh, for another um, almost you know, two to three months, they will continue to uh, come back to the tree uh, where the uh, adults uh, continue to, to uh, tend them, uh, especially continue to feed them uh, as the chicks themselves are learning how to fish. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, the adults are completely white in color. Uh, chicks, on the other hand, uh, uh, when they hatch can be a, a, a range of colors from um, uh, light brown to almost golden uh, to dark brown to, to gray. Uh, but as they age, uh, they lose that, uh, the, the down and uh, are replaced with, with feathers that are all white. As I mentioned, they uh, um, they uh, they have uh, fairly long, sharp claws in the end of each of their feet. This little chick in the, down the lower left-hand corner, you can see it's a, that chick is very very young, only a few days old. But uh, if from the time they hatch, uh, they are equipped to be able to uh, uh, grip the uh, the bark of the tree and to hold on. Um, I, I know from experience, I've uh, uh, in rescuing small chicks, uh, you, we, you pick them up and sometimes those claws, you'll sink in pretty good and it's, uh, uh, have to be careful when we uh, take them off of our, our hands to uh, place them back in the tree. Those, the, they, they are equipped from the time they hatch uh, to be able to, with what they need to, to stay in the trees. You know, so in addition to all this, uh, the, the, uh, the white terns uh, have special social and cultural significance. Um, the Hawaiian name for them is Mana Oku, bird of Ku, and uh, Ku being one of the principal Hawaiian deities. Um, for some reason, uh, they named this bird after a, a deity, and it's the only um, bird to be named after a uh, Hawaiian deity. We're not quite sure what, uh, what it means. Um, but uh, the fact that it was named after Ku um, must mean that it, that it had a special significance for uh, uh, the uh, early Hawaiians. Um, we also know that the Amano Ku is very important and the traditional Polynesian uh, uh, navigation, uh, wayfinding. Um, they were able to use celestial navigation to find island groupings, to find uh, to find islands, but to actually um, make their way to the island when, when getting close, uh, they needed other clues. Um, and one of the clues that they uh, relied on was um, white terns of, uh, since terns are seabirds, uh, but they lay their eggs on land and raise their chicks on land, uh, they go out to sea to, to fish uh, to catch fish to bring back to their chicks. And when they catch a fish, they do go straight back to land, straight back to where the chick is. So 
the uh, Polynesians uh, knew that uh, if they saw a white tern with a fish in its mouth, uh, it was going to it was flying directly to land. So that uh, uh, if you follow them, then they will take it on land. Uh, another reason uh, uh, that uh, we pay particular attention to the terns is it's the official bird of the city and county of Honolulu, uh, having been given that designation back in, in 2007. And uh, as, a, uh, as a migratory bird, which they are, uh, they're protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, that's a federal law that uh, makes it illegal to do uh, to do any of these things uh, uh, with, the, with the birds, uh, including uh, disturbing them while nesting. Um, and they are also protected by uh, uh, Hawaiian laws, um, state laws that uh, um, protect them and uh, the, the, their eggs um, and uh, the nesting sites while they are breeding. Um, the penalties can be quite stiff, up to fifteen thousand uh, dollars, including imprisonment. And uh, those laws are enforced by the Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, but both uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and DLNR would uh, rather be spending their time uh, training the trimmers how to avoid uh, breaking the laws uh, than uh, spending their time prosecuting them for breaking the laws. So. Uh, uh, they are working, we're working with them, partnering with them uh, very actively to uh, help to make sure that uh, tree trimming companies are aware of the, uh, the, the best practices based on the uh, current understanding of white term breeding behavior. Helping, helping them to understand that yes, indeed, they can trim the trees while the turns are present, uh, but the, helping, them to under, helping them to know how to do that in a way that doesn't result in disturbing the, the, the turns. And uh, the way to do that is to, to plan for uh, there being your turns in the tree. Um, <clears throat> because we've been studying the turns now for, for a number of years, and because we've been documenting where the, the trees are that they breed in, and uh, in, in very many cases, actually documenting this, the, the nesting spots that they use in the trees, and because we put that information uh, online, uh, make it available on maps and in databases, uh, tree trimmers are now able to uh, actually go online and to uh, you know, survey the areas that they're gonna be working in to identify trees where turns are known to be nesting, and then to uh, look further to see if uh, a breeding activity has been documented in them recently. Um, and then in addition to uh, those online tools, we are also now putting a, a blue ribbons on trees to indicate that uh, white terns are nesting there. And we also teach them how to uh, actually you know, survey on the site to look for uh, nesting activity. And then we also ask them if, uh, if you are working in trees and you come across uh, nesting terns that uh, weren't documented, please share that information with us so we can get it into the database, uh, get the tree onto the map and uh, uh, help to uh, uh, share the information uh, with uh, the rest of the tree trimming community. Uh, so if you are a, a, a property owner and uh, you have trees that you know, need to be uh, uh, trimmed, um, you can help to, um, help to protect any turns that, that may be using those trees by uh, uh, selecting tree trimmers that uh, have been trained. Um, uh, go with professional uh, tree trimmers. Uh, there are lots of companies out there um, on Oahu that have received the training. Uh, uh, tried to pick one of them. Uh, and there is a growing number of tree trimming companies on Oahu that have received the training and uh, that you can have uh, confidence uh, will um, take precautions to uh, check the trees and make sure that uh, uh, as they're working in the trees that they're not gonna be disturbing uh, nesting turns. Uh, you can uh, 
these are the, these are uh, tree trimming companies that uh, have been trained uh, so far. We recently trained uh, you know, some more companies. Uh, their names aren't on the on the list on, on this list list yet. But if you uh, visit the Aloha Arborist Association website, they do maintain a, a list of of companies that have received the training. Uh, so amongst, uh, I mentioned we have online resources that are available you know, to the trimmers, they're available to the general public as well. Uh, if you go to uh, our, our website, www.whiteturns.org, uh, we have uh, uh, a, a map that shows the location of all the trees where they're known to, to, uh, to breed. You click on any one of those pins and information will pop up, um, giving you information about the tree, the species, uh, as well as uh, uh, links to photos of nesting spots in the trees to help you, to help uh, the tree trimmers know uh, exactly where to, where to be looking uh, to avoid disturbing uh, terns that may be nesting there. We also have an, uh, an app that you can download uh, onto your smartphone or mobile device that allows you to also uh, access the map and information about uh, the, the the, uh, the nesting spots and breeding activity in the trees. You know, these are available to, to trimmers, to, to uh, the tree care professionals as well, so that uh, they can access uh, the uh, resources, the online resources while in the field. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, the turn tape has probably been you know, um, one of the, the, uh, the best things that uh, we've uh, started doing. Uh, to help protect the turns and to help protect the tree trimmers uh, from uh, disturbing them. Um, you probably have seen the, the tape around town uh, that those blue ribbons indicate the presence of uh, uh, active breeding in the trees. We um, put the ribbons up when we see uh, an angular chick in the tree and we take the ribbons down when we uh, no longer see eggs or, ch or chicks in trees. Um, each ribbon has a QR code that links it to the online resources. Uh, we also uh, put a unique four character code on uh, the ribbon that identifies, uniquely identifies uh, the tree. Uh, so if you, you have any questions about breeding activity in that tree, or if you find a, a chick uh, on the ground under one of those trees, you can give us that, uh, that uh, four character code and we can go into the database and uh, Pull up information about uh, the uh, breeding activity in the tree, the, ne the, the nesting spots, and uh, that helps us to uh, um, reunite the chicks with the with the adults, um, and um, helps us to continue to maintain uh, current information about the breeding activity in the trees. And once we put a ribbon on a tree, we try to check that tree at least once a month. Uh, what we don't want to have happen is uh, uh, blue ribbons on trees when there is no longer breeding activity so that uh, uh, so we want the, the trimmers to have confidence that uh, a blue ribbon uh, indicates the, the, the presence of active breeding activity and isn't just left over from uh, uh, some previous breeding event. Uh, we also point out though that uh, the, if you don't see a uh, blue ribbon on a tree, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no breeding activity. Uh, it could mean that uh, we put a ribbon up and somebody else took it down for some reason. Uh, that does happen, unfortunately. Uh, it could also mean that uh, that's, a, that's a new tree that the terns are breeding in and we just uh, haven't discovered it and it hasn't been reported to us yet. So uh, uh, the, the, the turn tape is helpful, but uh, the, the, the trimmers uh, need to continue to be careful to survey the trees uh, uh, before they start working in them. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have had instances where ribbons have been removed from trees. We've also had cases where ribbons uh, that were removed from, from uh, some trees have been placed on other trees. We've seen a few cases where they actually were put on palm trees um, so far, we have not seen turns uh, ne uh, nesting in palm trees. So if uh, you see a ribbon on a palm tree, there's a good chance that it was one that was taken off of another tree and uh, put there by, uh, yeah, it was put there by someone else. <clears throat> uh, so amongst the things that uh, we uh, um, it, uh, teach the uh, 
tree care professionals to, to look for is uh, how to identify adults in, in the incubating position. Um, a turn that is just perching in a tree, resting in a tree is apt to be, uh, you know, standing on, a, you can, uh, standing on its feet or, or hunched down. But uh, when they're in a nesting position, they're, it's, uh, they are belly, you know, belly down in, in close contact with a tree. And sometimes you can actually see uh, the, what we call an egg bump. That's where the feathers are sort of bloused out over the, the egg. Uh, but that, what you see right there is a classic uh, incubating position. And again, if you see one in that, in that position for an extended period of time, you know, over a number of days, yeah, it's a very, very likely on an egg or possibly even uh, brooding a small chick. We also look for the, look for the uh, white droppings on the ground. Um, since uh, terns are seabirds, they eat fish and, and only fish. Uh, and their digestive systems are highly optimized to, uh, to completely process the fish so that uh, what goes in one end comes out the other end simply as uh, white or uh, white droppings. It looks almost like whitewash that's uh, been dropped on the, the ground beneath the nesting spot. Uh, so if you see a cluster of white droppings like that and look up, there's a very good chance you'll see a, 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 a white turned chick. And uh, the longer the chick is up there, uh, the older the chick is, uh, the, um, the, the heavier that cluster of droppings uh, below becomes. Uh, another thing we teach them to watch for is unattended chicks in trees. Uh, once a chick is more than a, a few days old, uh, they're spending most of their time alone in the tree. Uh, so chicks can still be quite small, but be unattended. And sometimes the, uh, the color, coloration of, the, of their down uh, coverings uh, cause them to you know, really blend in with the color of the branch. So uh, uh, we, we teach the, the tree trimmers what to look for to help uh, avoid uh, uh, disturbing or injuring a small unattended chicks. Also point out uh, a chick that uh, is uh, not uh, unattended at the time by an adult does not necessarily mean that it's, that it's been abandoned. Uh, we quite often get calls to uh, the hotline that we maintain of um, concerned citizens uh, seeing uh, white turned chicks alone in trees and being concerned that it's uh, abandoned and needs rescued. Uh, you know, likely it's, it's just uh, sitting there waiting for its next meal to be delivered to it. Another very, very, very good clue that there's a, uh, a chick uh, in that tree is uh, an adult with fish in its beak. Um, now, an adult with fish in his beak uh, and no chick nearby, that probably means that, that uh, the uh, chick is now able to fly, um, but uh, will be back uh, to receive its uh, uh, fish allowance at, at some point. Uh, we also uh, go through a little exercise with tree trimmers just to, to help them uh, appreciate how difficult it can be sometimes to, or to find a um, uh, a, a, um, a chick in a tree. Uh, this is a picture of a, a tree trimmer, a tree uh, uh, trimmer working in a tree. As you see, the, the adult is flying around there. Um, and we challenge them to see, uh, you, can you see that chick in there? And uh, yeah, you look closely, look closer, closer, closer. You can see, yeah, there he is. And yes, indeed, that the, uh, the tree trimmer is uh, quite close to the, the chick, but the trimmer is aware of the presence of the chick and is uh, uh, being careful, you know, following the, uh, the guidance that we provide for how to work in trees without disturbing uh, uh, the, the chicks uh, and demonstrate that yes, indeed, you can successfully uh, and safely trim a tree uh, with uh, nesting turns present. Uh, so one of the things that we, uh, uh, a concept that we um, uh, train the trimmers about is what we refer to as a buffer zone. And that would be the area uh, around a turn. Uh, think of a, a cone or a, around a turn that extends out from the turn uh, laterally, but also uh, vertically ab above the, the, the turn. Uh, whether it's a, a nesting, um, a, an adult incubating an, an egg or, or a flightless chick. 
the caution that we that we give is um, uh, be careful when trimming above a, a, uh, a nesting churn to make sure that uh, trimmings don't fall you know, down through that that buffer zone uh, and could um, injure or you know, disturb the, uh, the the nesting adult or the the flightless chick. Uh, so trimming around the, tr uh, the turns uh, carefully means of being careful in how you trim above them as well. Very, very important. And we also you know, teach them uh, when, when working around turns, there are certain things you can do to um, uh, minimize uh, anxiety uh, that you might cause them. Um, uh, move slowly, um, avoid eye contact with them. Uh, birds can tell when you're looking at them, and one of the ways that they uh, know that you're looking at them is uh, the orientation of your head, your face, your eyes. Uh, so uh, 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 we've learned that uh, when approaching uh, turns, if you avoid making eye contact with them, they will be less, uh, less, um, less anxious. <clears throat> And uh, when working you know, close to them, um, approach slowly, allow them to get used to your presence, and by all means, avoid sudden, sudden movements and loud, loud noises. And then to continue to watch, just watch the, the turns just to see how are they responding. And if they begin to show anxiety or stress, agitation, then you'll, you'll back off. A series of do's uh, along with some don'ts, but the do's include um, uh, choose, choose tools that are appropriate to um, uh, your distance and working, uh, choose tools that are appropriate to the proximity of uh, nesting turns. When working in close, for example, use hand tools. And uh, it, uh, Try to um, be working with someone on the ground who can um, be, be watching. Uh, when you're up in the tree, you're probably paying, uh, you're, you're looking out for other things. Uh, someone on the ground can help to see things that perhaps you can't see from uh, while up in the tree. And then uh, as trimming, as you're trimming, um, be careful to, to leave uh, um, a nice, you know, your density to the crown of the tree but uh, open it up enough so that uh, turns can you know, easily fly in under the, the canopy and then you know, uh, from the sides, but also to fly under the canopy within the tree. Um, that makes it easier and safer for them to come in to, to tend their chicks. And also very importantly, uh, makes it a safer environment for chicks who are learning how to fly as they fly from branch to, bar to branch uh, without getting their wings you know, you know, tangled up in uh, and small twigs and, and branches. And uh, the things not to do is uh, listed here. Uh, particularly, uh, be careful about shaking a branch of the tree and don't drop breed that, that back down through the, that, um, that buffer zone that, that uh, could uh, disturb uh, a nesting adult or a, uh, a flightless chick. And if something does happen, <clears throat> and it does happen on occasion, uh, don't keep it to yourself. Uh, let us know about it. Um, there are contacts that, the, that we advise the trimmers to call. Uh, call us, the, the Monoku hotline. Uh, call Fish and Wildlife Service or call DLNR. Um, we all work together to uh, uh, try to help to make sure that uh, trimmers are prepared to uh, avoid uh, uh, injuring turns. But if it does happen, we also all work together to uh, try to, to make sure that lessons are learned and that uh, laws are enforced as well. Um, Sometimes tree work needs to be done because uh, it's considered to be an emergency. We work with the tree trimming companies to help them understand that uh, um, emergencies, um, there's a difference between emergencies and uh, convenience. Um, in the case of real emergencies, uh, work can be done, um, but it, uh, the, the certain criteria that need to be met before uh, work can proceed.
And if, uh, you, if, if it truly is an emergency and work does need to be done, uh, then the uh, DLNR or Fish and Wildlife Service need to be contacted so that they can uh, be working with the tree trimming companies uh, to make sure that uh, measures are taken to, uh, to uh, prevent injury to the uh, nesting, ad nesting adults or to, to chicks. Uh, but then, as I say, uh, emergency work you can be done, but it needs to be done in such a way as to uh, you protect the chick. And this this is a, a case of a tree that uh, needed to um, needed to come down. Um, there was a an egg. There was a, a, a young chick in the tree. Um, the decision was made that um, the tree could be left standing, uh, but the branches removed. Uh, that would decrease the the uh, the, uh, the weight of the tree, and by leaving just the branch that had the the chick on it, uh, the tree could safely remain. Uh, in this case, uh, they they did that. The chick ultimately fledged, and then the, the remainder of the tree you know, could be removed. So, you, emergency work can be done. Trees can be removed, but uh, needs to be done in such a way as to not. Uh, you know, injure uh, or disturb nesting turns. <clears throat> yeah, so in addition to uh, um, uh, trimming the trees and uh, preserving good breeding ha habitat for the trees, and that's an important point uh, that I haven't made yet, uh, the trimming that the, tr that the uh, uh, the trimming that the tree care professionals do to the trees actually improves the breeding habitat for the terns. Uh, we, we know that because uh, when we see two trees side by side, same species, one's trimmed, the other one's not, invariably the terns will, will nest in the tree that has been trimmed. Uh, by trimming, uh, they make it easier for the turn, for the adults to fly in and out of the tree to tend their chicks, um, but it also makes it a safer place for the chicks to learn how to fly because they've moved, uh, um, you know, small branches and twigs that uh, the chicks uh, may, you know, could get tangled up in uh, while learning how to fly. So that's very important, very important work. Um, but another way in which uh, the, the tree trimmers uh, are valuable partners in uh, working with the terns is that they have uh, unique skills uh, to, uh, that we sometimes uh, are in need of to uh, successfully reunite chicks with their parents. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we got a call of a, uh, a, a chick that was down, found under a tree over uh, near the uh, art museum. Uh, when we got the call, uh, had a bad feeling this is probably going to be a very, very young chick because the only nesting spot known in the tree was um, uh, Last time it was surveyed, had an egg in that, and it had been surveyed recently. Well, as it turns out, that chick had you know, hatched, and apparently the first thing it did, because they noticed that it was still wet, apparently the first thing it did was uh, fall out of the tree, but landed in that bush first and then fell onto the ground. The nesting spot was very, very high up in the tree, so we knew we were going to need the, uh, the assistance of uh, one of our uh, arborist friends. Uh, this is uh, Lake Gibby from the Amua tree tree trimming company. Uh, we called Lake and uh, we were able to show Lake exactly where in the tree the nesting spot was. And uh, he brought his gear and uh, climbed the tree. And then once he got up there, <clears throat> we sent the chick up to him in a little a fabric bag. And then uh, having shown Lake exactly where the nesting spot was, uh, Lake uh, gently placed the, the chick back uh, where it had fallen from. Did a little house cleaning while he was up there. And uh, complete, completed the job and the adults came back and uh, uh, resumed tending and caring for the for the chick, and uh, that chick ultimately uh, fledged uh, successfully. So yeah, we are uh, very very grateful for the uh, the work that the that the tree trimmers do in um, trimming the trees, helping to uh, improve the breeding habitat for the terns, and then uh, 
uh, helping us uh, when uh, when 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 called upon to uh, uh, put chicks back in the tree so they can be reunited with their parents. Uh, yeah, so this has uh, been about uh, agriculture, agriculture professionals uh, helping us to protect, protect uh, the Mono Oku. Uh, the guidelines that we came up with are uh, posted on the, uh, the Aloha Arborist website, uh, available for them to download. And if you're interested in knowing uh, what those guidelines are, uh, you can also go to the website and download them. We also have them uh, posted on the, uh, the Hui Mano Oku webpage. Uh, if you are a tree trimmer uh, or uh, um, work with someone, a tree, company, tree trimming company that is not yet trained, uh, you can refer them to the Aloha Arborist Association uh, so they can sign up for, for training to, uh, so they can uh, have their name added to the list of uh, Mana Oku trained uh, uh, tree care professionals. Uh, again, uh, a, a shout out of uh, thanks to our partners uh, in this project, to the Aloha Arborist Association and the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, DLNR. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions you might have. Uh, there's a question from Marsha. Marsha, do you want to ask it? Or Marcy? Uh, Hi, you want me to ask it myself? Yeah, you can. You want me to ask? Um, first of all, I just want to say that was so fascinating. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I was wondering when you said that for the tree trimming companies that it works best if they have like a buddy down below just watching for the birds because the actual tree trimmer is busy doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that tree trimming companies would be willing to pay for one worker just be a bird watcher down on the ground. That just seems pretty expensive. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, normally when the crew shows up, it's uh, more than just one worker. Um, there's uh, for the, the foreman on, on site and uh, the guy up in the tree with uh, with the chainsaw or with the, the hand pruning uh, gear, whatever they're using to, to trim the tree at the time. Yeah, so typically there's um, there are a number of people on site. Um, now I say that uh, that's that's especially the case with uh, the more reputable, uh, larger you know, tree trimming companies. Um, yeah, so there's they I think I think even by their own um, practices, especially if they're using a, a boom. Uh, you know, a truck with a with an arm. They need to have somebody down the ground, that's able to to watch to make sure that uh, the uh, the guy in the tree is is uh, not putting himself at risk as well. So yeah, there's 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 uh, typically you know, more than one person at, at the site. Okay, so that it's not a dedicated bird watcher; it's just somebody watching anyway from the ground usually. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Looks like uh, Bob has a question. That was uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, the, uh, the the birds are lucky to have you. Uh, I was curious about their distribution, uh, and lots of times distribution is related uh, in a very real way to uh, their food supply. And you mentioned that it was fish. I wonder if there's been any correlation with their distribution as it relates to their source of food. In other words, if we don't see these in other parts of the island, does that mean that there isn't much of a food source in that area? Or is this thing con driven by roosting areas, which I doubt? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. That was one of the first questions we had as to um, of all the places in the major Hawaiian islands, why? Oahu, Waikiki, uh, why, they, why do they breed there and no place else in the major Hawaiian islands? Um, uh, a, couple of, a couple of reasons that, that we, uh, I guess we're, we're feeling fairly confident about. Um, one is uh, relative lack of predators 
um, in the downtown Honolulu Waikiki area. Uh, predators for the terns include uh, rats, uh, feral cats, mongoose, and uh, yeah, we have all of those, you know, in town, but we have fewer of them in town than outside of town. Um, and uh, another indication that, that that may well figure into uh, why the terns nest you know, in town. Uh, if you look at Kalakaua Avenue from uh, Kepulani uh, up to uh, your Baratania, uh, the media, that row of uh, black mahogany trees in the median there, um, virtually year round, terns are nesting in those trees. Uh, and if I'm a rat and I have a notion to go collect uh, an egg or a small chick, you know, good luck to me getting across either lane of uh, Kalakaua without getting run over. And we do find occasionally your dead rats, roadkill uh, along that street. So um, that's a pretty safe place, I guess, uh, if you're trying to protect yourself from uh, uh, ground-based predators. Um, so that's, what, that's one reason. Uh, another reason is um, we think is, is the, the way that the trees are trimmed in town. Uh, yeah, they're trimmed elsewhere, but boy, they really pay good close attention to them uh, you know, downtown. Um, yeah, so uh, we do see them fishing off other parts of the island, um, but we never, we so far have not seen them breeding in other parts of the island. So they they will range some distance to go to go fish, but they they come back to that area uh, to to breed. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Yep, certainly. Uh, Susan Scott had a question. <laughs> Susan, you want to ask it? Thank you, Rich. It was great, great to see you and hear you again about our turns. <laughs> I, I may have missed it, but what's it current estimated population? Yeah, current estimated population, uh, it's growing. Uh, so it started with the, um, with uh, two or a few back in 1961. That was when the, uh, the current uh, uh, breeding population was, was uh, first seen. Uh, we were pretty sure they had been on Oahu prior, but the current population we went back to uh, 1961 when a, when a pair was seen breeding on the side of uh, your cocoa head. Um, there have been a, a number of surveys over the years. Uh, the most uh, recent, most complete one was uh, complete in 2016. And uh, we documented about 2,300 uh, at the time. Uh, we're looking to do another uh, survey. We had hoped actually to do one uh, this past year, but uh, COVID uh, has sort of made that uh, not possible. Um, but the one of the one of the uh, uh, ways that we are sort of tracking their numbers now is um, watching to see how many how many nesting spots are used from year to year. As I, as I mentioned, we document the actual spots in the trees where they lay their eggs, um, and we see them coming back and using the same spots over time. So um, we're pretty sure that. Um, Spots, nesting spots are only being used by one pair. And uh, given the number of eggs that we saw, uh, the number of active nesting spots being used uh, uh, last year, 2019, uh, uh, we calculate there are at least 2,300 on breeding turns. Uh, if you add in the, 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 those that aren't breeding, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's over 2,500, but uh, yeah, we, that, that's as close as, as we'd hazard a guess at this point. The number continues to grow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Any else? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna conclude the seminar tonight. Um, once again, thank you to Rich, Richard uh, for uh, and very informative talk. Um, also staying up with us. I know it's very late there, so appreciate it. Um, also like to thank my coworker Morgan for helping me conduct the seminar. You guys can't see her, she's kind of hiding in the shadows, but. Um, and please tune in next week on Thursday, April 29th. Uh, we are hosting Tom, I'm hoping I'm saying his name, last name right, 
fake. And he will be talking about bird watching and photography in East Oahu. So um, thank you for tuning in to tonight's Anama Bay Education Program seminar and hope you can tune in to next week's seminar. With that, and thank you all for your yeah. continuing interest in the turns. With that, mahalo and aloha. Yep, yeah. aloha and mahalo and you guys have a great weekend. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you.